And we'll sing, this is my favorite hymn, Watch Ye Saints. That's what we're to be doing, right? Watching and waiting and praying and um, studying and um, encouraging one another. That's why we're here today to praise the Lord and encourage one another. And Watch Ye Saints, 598. <coughs> Watch ye saints with eyelids waking, lo, the powers of heaven are shaking. Keep your lamps all trimmed and burning, ready for your Lord's returning. Go Of your sins. 
great when mystery is finished. Yes, 2.13, Jesus is coming. He is coming again. This is Caden's favorite song, so of course it's definitely one of mine too. 2.13, Jesus is coming again. to hear Kai sing with the top of his lungs. That's how Caden used to sing this song, because he's coming again, isn't he? Yeah, praise the Lord. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I want to welcome you all to the Honewald Seventh-day Adventist Church today. We are thankful that you had joined us in, in worship today. We also want to extend a warm welcome to those that are watching us online. Uh, we're glad you tuned in, and we hope you enjoy the service. Um, now, there's a few announcements that I just want to draw your attention to. Uh, first off, this afternoon. Who knows what's going on this afternoon? Yes, yeah, we see a few hands. So there's an awesome spring concert that has been put together this afternoon. It is going to be held uh, just down the road at the Baptist Church uh, here in Conewald because we have space limitations. We uh, have asked to uh, do the concert there. But we have the Centerville Christian School coming and joining us, and I saw a sneak peek of what the program looks like. It's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. Uh, you can find the address to the church in your bulletin insert, so uh, look for that. And we want to see each and every one of you there. So it's going to be awesome. Um, next Sabbath, just want to re give you a reminder the church building here will be closed. We are going to, uh, next Sabbath is our camp out Sabbath, and we, ha we are going to be having church at the Meriwether Lewis um, Park just down here on the Trace. And uh, we're going to be having church down where we had it last year, uh, down by the creek. So it's going to be a wonderful day. Hopefully weather cooperates with us, but just remember that. Um, and, yeah, oh yes, and we have um, an announcement about the Pathfinders.
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Pathfinder Club, um, well, Miss Mandy and Dylan are, of course, home getting ready for uh, Baby Wagner, but uh, they wanted us to make an announcement and invite you all to our Investiture Pathfinder and Adventurer Club Investiture service. Uh, that's going to happen May 11th. In the, it's going to be in the afternoon, so um, what time? 2.30. 2.30? Yeah, so for those of you who don't uh, understand or, or know what the investiture uh, service is all about, it's basically where uh, the Pathfinders uh, come to together at the end of the year and they get their honor patches for all the accomplishments and the honors that they've been working so hard uh, through the year on. And um, anyways, it's, uh, it's really a, kind of a, a high day for us as Pathfinders and, uh, and adventurers. And uh, we'd just love to uh, have each and every one of you uh, come and enjoy that with us. And we are in our last two months of Pathfinders, so we're gearing up for a lot of things, including a camp out the first weekend in May, which uh, will be fun for all. Um, but with the addition, last year we had 16 Pathfinders. Now we have 38 uh, Pathfinders and Adventurers. So the numbers have grown. And uh, in planning the food for a camp out, as you can imagine, the um, price, with the increase in prices and all, um, as well as more, more people involved, it's, uh, it's gotten up there in, in money. So uh, we just solicit your prayers. If you feel on your heart to give, please do so to the Pathfinder Adventure Club on your tithe envelope. Thank you all for your prayers. It's exciting to see how many kids are involved in the Pathfinders and how many kids we have involved throughout our throughout our district here. Um, just want to say a happy birthday to all of those uh, that have had birthdays this month. We see a few, we see most of them listed here in, uh, uh, in the bulletin. I see Easton just had a birthday a, a couple days ago and uh, Miss Joelle just had a birthday as well. So if you see them around, Oh, and Mr. Ben Wilsdorf had a birthday as well. So if you see them around, make sure to, uh, to tell them happy birthday. Um, at this time, we're going to prepare our hearts for worship. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be in your house of worship this Sabbath morning. Thank you for bringing us, each of us here today. Just pray that we would enter into a spirit of worship and that your spirit would be in our midst as we worship you today. May we gain the blessing that you have in store for each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals for our opening song, 470. There is sunshine in my soul today, 470.
That is such a happy song. There's sunshine in my soul today. Now, it is time for our praise and prayer time. So if you guys have a praise or a prayer request, raise your hands up high. A mic will be brought to you, and uh, you can share that. We have uh, Amelia, uh, or we'll go uh, with Jeanette. Hi. Um, Dusty and Hudson hadn't been feeling good this week. They're feeling a bit better now, but they could use some prayer that they're feeling much better because Hudson really needs to be in the prayer this afternoon. So pray for them and thankful for traveling mercies. A lot of people went with you, the Eclipse, and um, Matthew was traveling. We're very thankful for all the traveling mercies. Amen. Amen. I'm very grateful that my grandmother loves my mother and my brother because uh, they're sick. But also pray for all the students right now. This is a very, um, yeah, all the teachers giving everything all at once. So pray for them that we will get good grades and, um, yeah, everything will go well. All right. Yes, we have a hand way in the back right by the door. Uh, pray that my dad can, if it's God's will, my dad can find his kids here. Yes, yeah, well, you Keep that in prayer for sure. All right, yes, uh, Miss Donna. Happy Sabbath, and I'm thankful for this beautiful weather. Of course, comes with it with the allergies. <laughs> but um, please continue to keep my sister in prayer, my middle sister. Uh, her son, 39-year-old son, was driving on his motorcycle, and it was raining, and somebody cut him off, went in front of him, and he succumbed to his injuries. Mm -hmm. So... How we found out is nobody got a hold of anybody. I happened to get on Facebook, and his friends was posting in memory of JP. <laughs> so I had to call my sister in Virginia, and she had to call my sister in South Carolina and let her know. So oh. no matter what, it's devastating to know you learn through Facebook that your son has just been killed. That's right. So please keep the family in prayers. And I know we have a lot of frustrations. Um, at times, and we get frustrated. But you know, God has a sense of humor. Uh, through the stressful week, I woke up this morning and I went into the office. Apparently, the eight baby chicks, somebody left the door open, and they're running around in the office. <laughs> so, <laughs> but luckily, they're pets, and we can grab them and put them back at. But it made me laugh, you know, of all the stressful that God gives you a little sense of humor. No, in the littlest of things. So just remember, there's always beauty in something. All the worst, I, I'm not good with words, but all the, the heartache, the pain, God gives us little happiness through nature or something. So always keep that in prayer to be thankful for what we have. Amen. Yes, John. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on what daughter Lydia said there. Um, Give you a little bit more insights on, uh, I borrowed my skid steer to a friend and told him all he'd have to do is just fill it up with fuel and bring it back. And Well, he took it to one of his friends, which I knew um, that he was doing, but I didn't realize it was quite out that far, which still don't matter. But anyways, he came back last Sunday and uh, the thing was gone and he had it locked up. Um, so apparently the guy went and got a Kubota skid steer key and went in and, and hauled it off. We've been trying to find uh, leads on it all week. Uh, finally, Wednesday evening, I found some really good numbers. Uh, took till about, uh, what was it, Thursday morning. Uh, yeah, Thursday morning on the way out, I got so many phone calls from a lot of different people. Um, they know pretty much exactly who took it, but of course we got to find evidence. I was literally just sweating wet in my truck. I, it took me about four and a half hours, which should, should have taken me two and a half hours to drive. I had to pull over so many times. I was just so overwhelmed by all the leads that I'm getting. And uh, but and then all, a lot of people were just uh, volunteering. They've been trying to get this guy. He's stealing trucks. He's stealing logs out of 8,000 acres of, of woods. He's stealing uh, ATVs like they're hot cakes. Hmm. Um, the whole neighborhood knows him. So... We were back on his property yesterday with about five different uh, law enforcement people, um, and Henry Gingrich here was back there, and uh, just riding around. I found a lot of tracks um, where he was using it, where he was using it to steal logs, and uh, just 
but we didn't find the skid steer. And we noticed he was very, the, the guy that we are pretty sure stole, he was very fired up. He was watching both areas, both pieces of property that the machine could be on. He was back and forth. And, um, so we know we kind of steered his little pot. Um, and, you know, it's $60,000 is what I paid for. It's 80000 to replace it. But, you know, that's that's not really um, a lot. But it's most mainly what I'm say asking for is, and I, and I feel guilty to ask for prayers because I feel like I never put in the community, like every time there's something going on with me, I, I beg for help and prayer or whatever, and I feel like I never put it back. But most of all, I really struggle with my thoughts. Um, and I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Amen. All right, good. Uh, well, just to praise to have a full, full worship service today. Amen. It's great to see everyone's faces here today. Uh, just a praise report with my wife. She has, she's had a great week. She's got more energy, more strength, um, less pain, um, just more active, more smiles, eating more food. You know, when you taste something good, you go back for seconds. And so we just praise God and we ask God for um, for an extra, for more of it, for seconds, for his for His um, goodness. Amen. So, Clint, and then we have Emerson up here in the front. Scott, go ahead, please. Uh, I just want to thank God for this weather. And then also there was a shooting in Principality yesterday here in Little Rock. I want to keep your family for prayer. all those in, pr in prayer yes my pony rebel um has a lame front hoof and he's been lame for like five months mm -hmm. four or five months and um i've been doing several treatments and he's just not getting better so just prayers that he'll get better soon all right good and we'll be and you'll be the last one <laughs> <laughs> I, I just praise god um the lord has impressed me to leave my career to become um, a full-time medical missionary and my mother, she thinks I'm crazy. She just thinks you need, she keeps sending me messages. You need to send out your resume, go back to work, you know. And I just got a call for Costa Rica. They want me to come and train them in, in health evangelism to help grow their church. And so they said, we don't have the money to pay for your ticket. And I said, wow, I don't have the money either. So that's an easy no. But I decided to um, open it up to my friends and family and trust God to see what he'll do. Before I said no. <laughs> so money started coming in. I was like incredibly, you know, amazed. And I had to speak for a prayer meeting uh, last Wednesday night. And somebody raised their hand um, and they said, how much is your ticket? And I told them, he said, I will pay for your ticket. God has impressed me to pay for your entire ticket. So the next Within 24 hours, the money was in my bank, and I was able to um, actually pay. And when I, t you know, and these are experiences that are helping my family and, and even myself to know that we can trust God. You know, we have a paid, uh, a fixed paycheck every week or every two weeks, but to be in full time ministry is an opportunity to trust God com implicitly. And I think that's what God is trying to do for us. So just please pray for me. I have a lot of preparation to do. And pray that this mission trip would be a blessing. Amen. Any unspoken requests? Yes. I know. We'll pray. For, uh, uh, Karen's sister came and uh, has cancer. They just found out. So it's already spreading. Well, we will keep her in prayer for sure. All right, at this time, let's sing uh, hymn number 671, Now, Dear Lord, as we pray.
your heavenly father we come to you this morning and we thank you for this beautiful weather that we've been having the beautiful sunshine that we have today and we bring we lift up those that are ill if we have uh miss dusty and hudson uh that are not feeling well today we pray that they will recover quickly as hudson has choir to sing in this afternoon uh, we want to pray for those that have lost family of, with Donna's sister and losing her son. And we want to pray for um, John and, his, and the loss of his skid steer, that if it be your will, that it be returned to him. And we pray that you will be with him in, uh, in a special way. We want to praise you for uh, what you've shown us that, you know, with how you've been working with uh, Miss Sherry, and that she has been doing, seeming to do better this week, that she's uh, having more energy. We want to pray for those that were involved in the Homewald shootings this uh, yesterday, and we want to pray for our pets that haven't been doing well, and um, we just want to praise you for all that you've provided for us, and um, thank you for how you work in wonderful uh, wonderful ways with um, providing the airfare for our sister to be able to go on uh, the medical mission training uh, to go train people to how to do medical mission work and we want to lift up those that uh, Karen's sister just came down with and they just discovered that she has cancer and that it's been spreading we want to pray for her that you will you will put a special presence in her life that you will be with them. And we want to lift up Norman as he is going to be speaking to us today, that you anoint his lips and you open our hearts to hear what he has to say to us. And we want you to draw close to us and be with us in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. This week's offering, the loose offering, is going to be going to Hope Channel International General Conference. And we want you to remember your local church budget, and if you can mark that in your tithe envelopes, as well as building projects and uh, the Pathfinders, as uh, Ms. Jessica shared, if you want to give to them, please mark that in the envelopes, and that would be much appreciated. At this time, will the deacons please come forward? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all that you've bestowed upon us, the gifts that you've given us, and we praise you for how we have heard testimony today of how you have provided for those who are doing your work. We also we want to return a tithe, and we want to return offerings to you to help your work go forward even further, and we want to, not that you need our money, you've proven that, but that it will be, it will help us in giving back to you. Um, please multiply these offerings as they are collected, and that they will um, be able to be used to bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, Amen.
All right, kids, you know what time it is? It is time for children's story, and it's time for you to participate in the program and go around and pick up the, uh, the offering for uh, the Centerville Christian School. So at this time, we're going to, the kids are going to be collecting an offering to go to our local uh, church school, uh, and then Amelia is going to be, Amelia Myers is going to be having our children's story today. Okay, good morning. Good morning. We've got a lot of you guys. Okay, so I have a question. How many of you have done a mirror maze or know what that is? No, okay. I, I didn't think so, so I have a plan B. How many of you have done a corn maze? Two, three. Okay, we need to do this as a church apparently. Okay, a corn maze. How many of you have done a maze on paper? Like you start from playing? Yeah, okay. So a corn maze is like that, but instead of drawing with a pen or pencil, you walk through the whole maze. And you can't really see where you're trying to go. You just know you're trying to get out. So they say, start here, and you will probably come out somewhere. And I went to a corn maze one time, and they had broken down little passageways between where you were supposed to go. And it actually made it a lot harder. A mirror maze is like a maze, but instead of just having like a little like wall, you have to go here and go there. Instead, the walls are all mirrors. And so you can't see where the where the hole is to get out. So you have to put your hands out and you have to try to touch it until you can figure out how to get out. Well, I'm going to read you a verse. It's in Jeremiah 29:11. It says, "For I know the thoughts that I think towards you," says the Lord, "thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope." So yesterday, I was not supposed to do children's story today, right? My mom was supposed to. And yesterday, I was getting in the car right before Sabbath, and I was running to the store to get some bread for lunch today. And in the front of my windshield was a bug. It was about this big. What do you think it was? Not a beetle. No. 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 That's a good guess. No. 
What is something, it's kind of like something, what is something we really hate in the summers here in the South? It's like a mosquito, but it's bigger. It's a mosquito eater, okay. It was about this big, and it was trying desperately to get out of my car. I do not know how I got in there, but it was very unhappy about being in the car with me. And I turned on the car, and I was back in my driveway, and I saw it. So I had to stop the car, and I now I'm trying to get this bug out of my car. I roll my window down, but you know what the problem was? It was trying to go out the windshield. Now, who here can go through glass? No, really? Are you sure? Have you tried it? Don't, don't try it, please. Okay, so you can't go through glass, and neither can this, this bug. And so I start trying to get it out, okay? And I was trying to get it out with my wallet, and I was like, well, forget this. And so I'm trying to scoop it out with my hand. The bug does not want to leave with me, does not want to go out my window. And I keep fighting with this bug and fighting with this bug and fighting with this bug. And I know that the only way for the bug to get out of the car is through this window. The window is open. I know this is the only way this bug can get out. And I also know if the bug stays in my car for long enough, it's going to die. And so I'm trying to save this bug from dying by getting out my window. But it didn't want to. The bug thought that it was smarter than me and that if it just tried hard enough, it could go through the window and get outside. You know, I finally was able to convince the bug to go outside, and it flew away, and it was happy. You know, it made me think a little bit. How often are we like that? God says, look, this is the way to go to heaven. This is the way to get to where you want to go. This is the way to serve me. This is the way to be happy. But instead, we're trying to go through the windshield. We think, no, no, I can see I'm going to be happy if I just get right there. But Jesus is saying, but you can't get there from where you're trying to go. You have to go my way. There's an interesting verse in Proverbs uh, 16:9, and it says, A man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. I think this is kind of saying you may have some really awesome plans, but they might just be trying to get through the windshield. You actually need to let the Lord, let God direct your steps so you can go through the window into the freedom and happiness of his love. So remember that. Next time your parents say, you know, I think you actually need to do this. Or next time God tells you, you need to do this. Remember that he's smarter than you. He can see the whole picture, and he can see if you're just butting against the glass. Okay? So let's pray. Can you close your hands and close your eyes? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you that we're all here at church. Please be with us and help us to remember that your ways are always best. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Please turn with, in, with me in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. That's Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. And when you get there, please say amen. It's wonderful hearing all the pages rustling. Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Matthew. And good morning. Happy Sabbath to all of you. It's good to be back with the church family. Very thankful to be here back in Hohenwald this Sabbath. And we're just so thankful for this church and for each one of you. The title for the message today is When the Sun Goes Dark. Before we get into the message, I'm going to ask the Lord to be with us. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us to church today to worship you. And I pray that the message today will 
Help us and bless us and challenge us and bring conviction where it is needed. And I pray that you would guide my mind as I speak. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this past Monday, April 8th, my family was in Bloomington, Indiana, and we saw the total solar eclipse. Now, I know we're not the only ones. I know the burritos were in Ohio. I know um, Dusty and her kids were somewhere, was it Kentucky or, yeah. And um, I, I think the Prisoners were in Texas. Did anybody else go to the totality that I didn't mention? Yeah, it was, you know, the difference between 95% or 98% totality and totality is the difference between night and day. And if you've never seen it, the good news is 21 years from now, it'll come through Alabama and Mississippi. But I've got to say, it's an amazing experience. And the, the verse that Matthew just read, I'm going to read again. Scripture says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. You know, we are such small specks, so to speak, in the cosmic universe, and yet God cares about us personally. And you stand there, and you know, you, it, it was so interesting. I mean, to me, the, the experience was breathtaking and really otherworldly. It's like it doesn't feel like Earth anymore when the sun gets blocked out in the middle of the day. And the colors start changing before the sky goes totally dark. And, you know, I had my eclipse glasses on. I could see the sun going completely dark, black. But when I took the glasses off, it was just this amazing feeling when you look up in the sky and the sun is completely eclipsed. And there's just this little ring of light around it. Um, you know, we were with people from Quebec in Canada, Wisconsin. Somebody from Oakland, California was at the place we were. And it just so happened that we found a place on the map right at the very center of totality. So there's like this red line um, that shows you exactly where the very center of totality is. We were fortunate enough to find a place that was right on that center line and other people found it too. And so the the sky went dark where we were for four minutes and three seconds, which is pretty long. Um, we went back in 2017 to the eclipse to where I grew up in Portland, where Highland Academy is, because I wanted to be somewhere familiar. Of course, this time we had no idea. We'd never been there before. Probably will never go there again. But this lasted over a, or yeah, a good minute and a half longer, almost a minute and a half longer than seven years ago, and just a really, really neat experience. And for me, as a believer in God, you see God's handiwork at place. It just the math behind an eclipse is rather remarkable. I mean, the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but the moon is 400 times closer to the earth than the sun, so therefore, there are certain times when they are aligned just correctly where you can have a total solar eclipse. And really, only God's handiwork can account for that. Now, you know, we have become sophisticated enough that even in times past, people smarter than me could calculate exactly when an eclipse would come. And of course, now scientists are so advanced. I mean, they know the very second the eclipse is going to start. They know the exact route that it's going to take. And they have the eclipses uh, mapped out for years to come. You know, it's interesting to me, when I was a sixth grader, I was 12 years old, we went to a planetarium in Bowling Green, Kentucky for a field trip. And they were telling us, this would have been 1989, they were telling us, hey, you guys are from Portland, Tennessee. You are in a perfect spot for the next total solar eclipse. I didn't even know what that was. All I knew was that on August 21, 2017, there would be this really neat eclipse that would come through Portland, Tennessee. And, you know, I moved different places and came back to Tennessee between 1989 and 2017. But I still remembered 
that we had been told all those years, 28 years earlier, that we were in a perfect spot for the next eclipse. So it's amazing what we can figure out. But you know, I have a few observations, because I'm not just going to talk about like standing up and looking at a sky for the next 30 minutes. Um, it's very interesting, and again, if you've never, ever been to one, and if you have a chance to go, you should go, if time should last. But I have a few observations about what just happened. First of all, maybe I wasn't paying attention as much back in 2017 as I was this time in 2024, but, you know, I didn't hear any doomsday, the world is going to end predictions back in 2017, like I did this go-around. And it's interesting, this go-around, um, there were some evangelical Christians out there who came to the so-called discovery that there's eight towns by the name of Nineveh in North America that were in the path of the eclipse. Now, if you look more closely, only two were actually in totality. The other six would be like 80 or 90 percent, but not totality. And I mean, here's the funny thing. I knew about this, and we had gone to um, Gatlinburg because I was speaking at ASI Southern Union last Sabbath. So then to get closer to the eclipse, we stayed in Cincinnati Sunday night. So we're driving from Cincinnati, Ohio into Indiana because that's where the weather looks good for Monday. And we're driving to really a spot we didn't know for sure we would get to until we found it. And on our way to wherever we were going, I look at the road sign and there it was, Nineveh, Indiana, turn left. And I looked at Joel, I'm like, we could go to Nineveh. We didn't. But if we had, we would have been in totality. You know, <clears throat> it, I guess what was a little bit surprising to me was I saw a, an online ministry that's affiliated with the Adventist Church, not as, a, as part of the Organist Church, but just you know, people who are Seventh-day Adventists who have a ministry who released a series of videos who started to make a really big deal about the fact that there were going to be towns called Nineveh in the path of an eclipse. And they talked about how the eclipse from 2017 went one way and the eclipse from 24 went another way, and that forms the shape of a cross, and then you have Nineveh, and then these evangelicals who are not Adventists are talking about how, well, Nineveh had 40 days to repent, so America's going to have 40 days to repent. And I, you know, I just want to step back and say something here. This is not how we study the Bible, okay? Like, when we study the Bible, we have a more sure word of prophecy where we have very clear prophecies of Scripture from Daniel and Revelation and Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, and there's other passages as well, that describe the signs of the coming of Christ and of the end of the world. Now, is it true that Scripture says that the sun, the moon, and the stars are signs that, that will be used for signs for seasons, for days and years? Sure, that's true. But we have not been given inspired evidence that total solar eclipses are a specific sign of anything in particular other than the fact that it shows that God is the creator of heaven and earth and that he is in control of the stars and the moon and the sun and that he is fully in control. You know, this ministry that released these videos also started to make some connections to statements from Ellen White about fireballs over Nashville and suggested, gave the strong impression from what I could see watching their videos, that the, the total solar eclipse of 2017 where the city of Nashville was in totality, now in 24 it was not, it was like 95%. They were trying to suggest that these total solar eclipses are a sign in the heavens of what God is going to do to Nashville. Now I have to say this too, that is pure speculation that you cannot prove. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have to be very, very careful about what we say because 
there is a more sure word of prophecy. And yes, are there things that are coming to the cities, not just to Nashville, but to all the cities. If you study inspiration, it's not just Nashville that is going to face judgments of God at the end of the world. It's all of the cities. But we have to be careful that we don't make specific connections to specific events that don't exist. And I want to point out, um, when you look at these total solar eclipses, mathematically speaking, you, the odds of you living in a place that will experience a total solar eclipse in your lifetime, it occurs about once every 360 years. Although sometimes places will have them within a few years of each other. So for example, Southern Illinois was in the path of totality in 2017, and it was again in 2024. So there was a town in Southern Illinois near Marion, Illinois, actually very close to 3 ABN, that got both total solar eclipses. So they bucked that trend. But most people, or most locations, um, these eclipses occur once every 360 years. But somewhere in the world, there's an eclipse happening pretty regularly. So for example, we just had this eclipse in 2024. The next eclipse in the world is August 12 of 2026, which goes through Greenland, Iceland, and Spain. Then there's one in August 2 of 2027 that goes through Egypt, Northern Africa, and Southern Spain. Now this one would be something to go to. Now probably you won't make it, but this particular eclipse will last nearly six and a half minutes. Now, the mathematically, the longest eclipse that could occur if everything lined up correctly is seven minutes and 41 seconds, if everything was lined up just right. And that had occurred about a thousand years ago, and there might be another one, I believe, in another over 100 years from now. So that can happen, but for example, the eclipse in 2017 in Portland was about two minutes and 40 seconds. So it's, it depends on um, how close the moon is to the sun. And if you go through the list of eclipses, there's gonna be one in 28, 2030, 2033, 2034, 2035, 2038, 2039, 2041, 2042, 2043, 2044, and then on August 12, 2045, if time should last, I'm interested in this one because it's my anniversary, it goes through Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, and then all the way through the heart of the country out to California. So if time should last, I'm gonna try to go to that one. That's 21 years from now. Um, so when you look at the fact that eclipses occur every one or two years, we can't then say that because the sun and the moon align just at a s perfect spot every couple of years somewhere on the earth that then this means that 40 days later there will be coming destruction to the territory that does not repent. That's just speculation. It's really sensationalism is what it is. Because now, in fairness to all that I've talked about, it's the evangelicals who have suggested this idea that just as Jonah came to Nineveh with a message that they had 40 days to repent, now they are the ones that are suggesting America has 40 days to repent. We know as Seventh-day Adventists that we are not to give a message to this world that is based on time. That since 1844, our message that God has given to us is a message that is not based on time. And in fact, we heard of a woman out of, outside of our denomination who thought that the rapture was coming when the eclipse came and she was going around and giving away money because she thought that time would be no more after the eclipse. Now she's trying to get the money back. Now here's where I want to place my focus. You know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we clearly believe in the imminent, literal, second coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. You know, for me, when I look at, looked up in the sky and I saw the sun eclipse, it's like this complete opposite of what, like, the coming of Jesus is like, but yet you can see God's hand in the heavens. The fact that God has such perfect order over the heavens and the earth Someday he is going to come and we're going to look up in the sky and we're going to see Jesus coming and we're going to say, this is our God. We have waited for him. But in our desire to see Jesus return, we have to be certain 
that we are teaching the more sure word of prophecy. To be clear, the prophetic messages of Daniel and Revelation are undeniable in their clarity about what is coming upon the world. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes a lot of us become interested in the 40 days after the eclipse messages because we may not have studied the clear prophecies of Daniel and Revelation in a way that we understand their clarity. When you see the clarity of the messages of Daniel and Revelation, you're not going to start thinking, oh man, maybe because there's eight towns with the name of Nineveh and the two eclipses over America recently are in the shape of a cross that America is rejecting Jesus' death on the cross and 40 days after the second eclipse, judgment will come to America. I mean, come on, that's not how we study the Bible. Yes, we need to make sure we are right with God, but we don't want to give messages that are based on false speculation. You know, as Adventists, I expect us to steer clear of sensational claims that are, not, that are not grounded in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. You know, this thing about the shape of the cross and Nineveh, it reminds me one time I heard a, a, a speaker in a, in a church talk about how the pool of Bethesda where people would be healed, Bethesda means house of mercy, and he said, you know, it's so interesting that if you break down, I don't know, some of you may have heard this before, but if you break down the word Bethesda and you break it into components, you can make it say B the SDA. Whoa. And he was serious. People laughed, and he's like, no, I'm serious. You know, Bethesda is simply an English translation of a Hebrew word. That's not how we study the Bible. Like, oh, wow, Bethesda means BDSDA. That is just an embarrassing way to interpret Scripture. We don't do that. Shapes of crosses based on eclipse, names of towns in America, this is somehow, the no, God speaks to us through his word, not through fanciful, speculative, sensational speculation. That does not then mean that I'm suggesting that we stay asleep. I do believe that events like these remind us of the awesomeness of God, of his control of heaven and earth, that we are living at the end of the world. If you study the prophecies, yes, we are living at the end of the world. But we have a clear message of prophecy that's not based on speculation or sensationalism. We have the more sure word of prophecy. We actually have signs that Jesus has foretold of his coming and of the end of the world. So I want you to get your Bibles out. And we're going to go to Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 and 30. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 and 30. Here Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days... Now, the tribulation that he's referring to is the 1260 years of persecution. And there was a tribulation that ended before the 1260 years came to their final end. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then verse 30 says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So just before Jesus comes back, he, Jesus says there will be uh, the darkening of, of the sun where the moon does not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then the next thing you will see prophetically is the coming of Jesus. And then in Mark chapter 13, if you turn there, Mark chapter 13, this is the same story from Mark's perspective. Mark says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. So here the second time Jesus says, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give her light. The stars of heaven shall fall. The powers of heaven will be shaken. And then you will see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. And then we go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 25. 
Jesus says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now I like, like verse 28. It says, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Now let me say this. A speculative, sensational approach to the study of scripture would come to these three passages and say, did you know that the sun being darkened in the eclipse is a sign that Jesus gave that just after the, an eclipse happens, Jesus will come in the clouds of heaven. That's what people will do sometimes with the study of scripture. But I'm here to tell you that that's not what these passages are talking about. And for good reason. There is clarity on what the sun being darkened as a sign of the coming of Jesus actually means. And we find this in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, starting in verse 12. Now, the context of this is this is the beginning of the sixth seal. Now, just for clarity's sake, the seals are a historical overview of what happens to God's people after Jesus ascends to heaven. And starting with the first seal and the white horse, we begin in the first century where we have a pure church that goes forth conquering and to conquer. And you go down, and I'm not going to take the time to go through all of these seals right now, but you go from a white horse to a red horse because the church goes from conquering and to conquer to being persecuted. Then you have a black horse, meaning a compromising church, then a pale or sick horse, meaning that the church has become sick and apostate. Then the fifth seal, you have a protest where those who are righteous and who have died metaphorically cry out saying, how long, O Lord, till you judge and avenge? And many scholars believe this represents the protest of the Reformation that began in 1374 with John Wycliffe and continued on with John Huss and Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and others. And then you come to the sixth seal. Now, when we look at these signs that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, you know that these are signs of Christ's coming and of the end of the world. And the next thing that you're going to see is the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So you're interested to know when would these signs take place, would you not? Well, the seals actually show us when they take place because the first seal takes us through the first century. The second seal takes us from 100 to about 313. The third seal takes us from 313 to 538. The fourth seal starts with a papal persecution of 538 and takes us to the beginning of the Reformation in 1374. So sometime after the beginning of the fifth seal in 1374, we will come to the sixth seal. And in the sixth seal, it says, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now, this is very fascinating, because now, as historicists, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are historicists, where we interpret history based on the light of prophecy, and we understand, sometime after 1374, that there's a massive earthquake that announces the opening of the sixth seal in heaven. This is the Great Lisbon Earthquake of November 1, 1755, that was so massive that it was felt on more than one continent. It was the Lisbon Earthquake, and it created such a tsunami that it destroyed what was left of Lisbon after the earthquake. That was 1755, and then it says, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now listen, these are the very signs that Jesus gave that would announce that the world is coming to an end. Let me read to you a little bit of history about this dark day. Now, I mentioned earlier that mathematically the longest the solar eclipse can last, can last is seven minutes and 41 seconds. The one in Egypt in 2027 will be 6 minutes and 23 seconds. That's a long time for the sun to be blocked by the moon. But this dark day of May 19, 1780, at the beginning of the sixth seal, 
was not for 7 minutes and 41 seconds. The sun went dark around 10 o'clock in the morning, and it stayed dark the rest of the entire day. There is no astronomical or meteorological explanation for it other than that the sky went dark. Now, if you look at a path of totality, for example, 2017 was a little bit narrower, narrower than the path that we just experienced in 2024. Most of New England was dark during this dark day. There's no explanation other, for, uh, other than it being a supernatural explanation. Let me read to you. This is from Great Controversy 306, and here Ellen White is quoting some historians. 25 years later, after the Lisbon earthquake appeared, the next sign mentioned in the prophecy, the darkening of the sun and moon. What rendered this more striking was the fact that the time of its fulfillment had been definitely pointed out. In the Savior's conversation with his, his disciples upon all of it, after describing the long period of trial for the church, the 1260 years of papal persecution, concerning which he had promised that the tribulation should be shortened, he thus mentioned certain events to proceed as coming and fixed the time when the first of these should be witnessed. In those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The 1260 years or years, 1260 years terminated in 1798. A quarter of a century earlier, persecution had almost wholly ceased. Following this persecution, according to the words of Christ, the sun was to be darkened. On the 19th of May, 1780, this prophecy was fulfilled. Now, here's what these historians say about it. Almost, if not altogether alone, as the most mysterious and as yet unexplained phenomenon of its kind stands the dark day of May 19, 1780, a most unaccountable darkening of the whole visible heavens and atmosphere in New England. That's from R.M. Devins. He wrote this in our first century. Then another historian says, an eyewitness, or she goes on to say, an eyewitness living in Massachusetts describes the event as follows. In the morning, the sun rose clear but was soon overcast. The clouds became lowery and from them black and ominous as they soon appeared. Lightning flashed, thunder rolled, and a little rain fell. Yeah, wouldn't that have been kind of creepy to be there for this? I mean, just think about it. What if you were living in this dark day? Toward nine o'clock, the clouds became thinner and assumed a brass or coppery appearance, and earth, rocks, trees, buildings, water, and persons were changed by this strange, unearthly light. Now, for those of us who, who were in totality, there is, there is this change of the colors shortly before totality, but this is a little bit different. And then it goes on to say, a few minutes later, a heavy black cloud spread over the entire sky except a narrow rim at the horizon, and it was as dark as it usually is at nine o'clock on a summer evening. Fear, anxiety, and awe gradually filled the minds of the people. Women stood at the door looking out upon the dark landscape. Men returned from their labor in the fields. The carpenter left his tools. The blacksmith his forge. The tradesman his counter. Schools were dismissed, and tremblingly the children fled homeward. Travelers put up at the nearest farmhouse. What is coming? queried every lip and heart. It seemed as if a hurricane was about to dash across the land, or as if it was the day of the consummation of all things. Candles were used, and hearth fires shone as brightly as on a moonless evening in autumn. Fowls retired to the roost and went to sleep. Cattle gathered at the pasture bars and lowed. Frogs peeped. Birds sang their evening songs, and bats flew about. But the human knew that night had not come. Dr. Nathaniel Whitaker, pastor of the Tabernacle Church in Salem, held religious services in the meeting house and preached a sermon in which he maintained that the darkness was supernatural. Congregations came together in many other places. The texts for the extemporaneous sermons were invariably those that seemed to indicate that the darkness was consonant with scriptural prophecy. The darkness was most dense shortly after 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, this was a clear sign that Jesus is coming again. And you know, there, there's more that you can, there's another two or three paragraphs. I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm going to close by reading from Great Controversy 308 where she says, May 19, 1780 stands in history as the dark day. Since the time of Moses, no period of darkness of equal density, extent, and duration has ever been recorded. The description of this event as given by eyewitnesses is but an echo of the words of the Lord recorded by the prophet Joel 2,500 years Previous to their fulfillment, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And that's from Joel 2.31. You know, then the next thing after that is the falling of the stars in 1833. And then you look 
So there's the earthquake, the, the dark day, the falling of the stars, and then verses 14 through 17 describe the second coming of Jesus, where the heaven departs as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? You know, if you don't know Jesus, you're afraid of his coming. But if you know Jesus, things like solar eclipses are not scary. They're just a sign that God's in control and that he has his hand over everything. But it's rather remarkable to think that with the beginning of the sixth seal, you have the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, the dark day of 1780, the falling of the stars in 1833. From our study of Daniel and Revelation, we understand that the investigative judgment began in 1844. And then we understand that Jesus is going to come in the clouds with power and great glory. And some may ask, if Jesus said that those signs in 1755 and 1780 and 1833 are the signs of his coming and of the end of the world, why are we still here in the year 2024? Have you ever wondered that? Well, the answer is found in Revelation chapter 7, and we could have a whole sermon on this, and that is this, that all of these things are going to take place after these signs, then Jesus will come, and then the four winds will be released, and then when the four winds are released, we will see the seven last plagues after probation closes. But the reason why the four winds have not been released is because God's last day people are not yet ready to receive the seal of the living God. That's why we are still here. So we can look to these signs, and these signs that Jesus gave, they occurred as sure as we are sitting here right now. That eclipse that happened on Monday occurred just as sure as we are all here right now. For those of us who saw it, we know what we saw. You can't tell us that what we saw was fake, and yet there's conspiracy theorists everywhere. I saw an Adventist just in the last day or two who said that NASA is lying to us and that what we see isn't really the moon passing in front of the sun. I mean, you can create a conspiracy for everything. But the reality is, is that these things have truly happened. The dark day of 1755, or excuse me, the earthquake of 1755, the dark day of 1780, and the falling of the stars in 1833. And just as those events surely happen, the coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven is surely happening too. And the way this world is going reminds us that we cannot go on much longer. And we as God's people need to be preparing ourselves to receive the seal of the living God. We are told in Maranatha, page 200, that to receive the seal is to settle into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. Now, some of us are good at settling into the truth intellectually so that we understand every point of our faith, but when it comes into the settling into the truth spiritually with having the fruit of the Spirit, we're not so nice there. We think that our knowledge of truth will overlook our faults of character. And yet there are others who say, well, as long as I love Jesus, it doesn't matter what I know. I'm not so worried about what's coming. I just need to know who's coming. But the problem is, if you don't know what's coming, you'll be deceived by the false, cro pro false Christ and false prophets who will arise and deceive many because you think it doesn't matter what truth is. And so the seal of God is a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. I pray that we as a church family will stand for truth. You know, there's always this pull in any congregation at any time, and especially as we come closer to the end of Earth's history to lower the standard away from Bible truth and to just say, it's okay, everybody else does it, so why don't we do it? That's not settling into the truth intellectually. 
But that's not enough, of course. I mean, I, I pray that we'll hold the standard high. But we need to have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, which is a demonstration of Christ's character. That, yes, we hold the standard high, but we're also nice about it. We're not mean, rude, legalists who make everybody feel miserable if they're not living up to God's light. And that can happen, but at the same time, just because there are people who are like that doesn't then give us license to throw those truths away. We want both. And so part of settling to the truth as well as to not run off for the latest wild and weird conspiracies. You know, I, I was thinking about this. Like I said, in 2017, I wasn't saying all these weird, alarmist, sensational ideas about what an eclipse meant. And then this time around, it was kind of crazy. kind of feels like COVID changed everything. It's like now that COVID came and went, it's like everything has a sinister meaning behind it. When not everything does. Yeah, some things do, but not everything. I mean, an eclipse is an eclipse. And yes, Jesus is coming again. But the specific signs of the darkening of the sun that point to the coming of Jesus, that happened back in 1780. And now we're waiting for God's people to settle into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that we will not be moved. I want to close by reading the statement from Testimonies, Volume 8, page 28. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. When that time comes, we don't want to be like people who simply run, and sat, run around and say, oh, we knew this was coming. We should be preparing ourselves and the world around us for what is soon to come upon this world. But the way we do so is not to be speculative or sensational, but to follow the sure word of prophecy. So let's stand on the, the firm word of God, and may we be faithful to that end. Amen. So I want to encourage us now to turn to our hymn of response. Hymn number 517, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Everyone, please stand. Father in heaven, we thank you for the more sure word of prophecy. We thank you for the signs and the heavens that you have given to us. 
the things that have happened at the beginning of the sixth seal way back over 200 years ago, and yet we know that the, the more time goes on, the more closer we are coming to the soon coming of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would settle into the truth intellectually and spiritually, that we would have a faith that looks up to you so that when Jesus comes, we will look up into the heavens and say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. May we be faithful, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.